Hello, welcome to the Monday, November 29th, 2021 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Our handler Jan this weekend took a look at a common trick phishing sites use to make investigations more difficult. The phishing email, as Jan described it, was pretty much unremarkable, but shortly after Jan reviewed the phishing site, the web server started returning 404 errors instead of the Outlook of 365 lookalike page that was used to harvest users' credentials. The author of the phishing site uh, took a precaution in only allowing a limited number of requests from a particular source IP. Now, there are a couple different reasons uh, why an attacker may do that. So once the time or uh, the request limit is exceeded, you get the 404 instead of the actual phishing page. And if a user, for example, would forward uh, the link uh, or the email uh, to an analyst, that of course then may result in a false negative. Or for example, the user thinks that, hey, they should probably uh, report that phishing page. They try to access it again, but well, they're now getting a 404, thinking probably that the phishing site has already been taken down. If you are investigating uh, phishing emails like this, always good to try an anonymous internet connection like a VPN or uh, some LTE uh, access or such with ever-changing IP addresses. Also, be a little bit careful with these URL parameters that are often being passed along. These are often unique identifiers. Uh, Sometimes it's just a base64 or URL encoded email address that is then being used to pre-fill, for example, a username. And Dell released an important update to its iTrack 9 products. Uh, The vulnerability is due to the use of ZeroMQ in these products. ZeroMQ is an open source messaging library. And back in September, the ZeroMQ project uh, fixed a buffer overflow vulnerability that could lead to a denial of service. Dell is now fixing this vulnerability in its iTrack 9 cards. Given that the vulnerability is not exactly fresh, there are proof of concept exploits available for it. So far, only denial of service. Another story sort of related to investigating, and that one is about how malware does detect whether or not it's running in a virtual machine or in some other prepared environment that is often used uh, to evaluate uh, malware. Recent versions of TrickBot are expanding the use of detecting screen resolution. The screen resolution of these virtual machines and uh, also even if it's uh, some other sort of system that is being used uh, to investigate the malware is often set uh, to very small, like as small as 800 by 600 because nobody's really going to watch the screen. And if you're taking screenshots, you really are sort of just interested in what the malware itself display so resolution is not an important and researchers don't want to incur the cost of the resolution now what's sort of a little bit different here is not just that it detects uh, what the resolution the system is running at but it's doing that very early on uh, when you're downloading the html so uh the way this trickbot works, very typical for trickbot, you're downloading a zipped HTML file, then that zipped HTML file is downloading a second stage. In the past, only the second stage did sort of uh, that detection. Now the HTML does it itself, so a researcher wouldn't even get uh, to uh, the uh, malware. And if you're using QNAP and network storage devices, in particular, if you have the QVR video recording software enabled on the device, there is a critical patch for you that patches two different vulnerabilities. One is a straightforward arbitrary command injection vulnerability. The second vulnerability allows for authentication bypass. So doesn't actually say if the first one requires authentication, but I assume if it does combine with the second vulnerability, it no longer does require authentication. 
I believe the software often comes sort of installed by default on uh, these QNAP devices, even if you're not actively using the device for a video recording or for surveillance. So if you don't use the software, uh, please just uh, disable and uninstall it. The update in this case does require a full firmware update according to QNAP. And if you have the ability to then run a quick check across your Linux systems for an odd cron job that's scheduled to run on February 31st. February 31st, of course, well, that date doesn't exist, but it's syntactically correct, which sort of makes it pass some of the checks that cron applies. And in the case of the cron rat malware, it's really just used to stash away some malicious code in the form of a base64 encoded string should be pretty obvious once you see it. Well, and that's it for today. So thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow.